Okay, I think we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to this webinar. Um, to Your Excellency Ambassador Anne Lamilla, Your Excellency Ambassador Tobias Elling Refeld, to our speakers, Gaylor Montmartin Clay, Trudy Makaya, Dr. Mer Memory Manchingabi, and Richard Bridal, to our attendees, um, thank you for joining us. My name is Chidom Zondo, and I'm an energy policy consultant at IASD, um, and I will be your moderator for this event. So ISD is proud to be co-hosting this webinar uh, with the Embassy of, of Finland in South Africa and the Embassy of Denmark in South Africa. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. So firstly, please note that we will be recording this webinar and we'll make all the presentations and the video available after the event. Uh, secondly, we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentations. Um, so please add your questions to the chat function in the Zoom window. Um, my colleagues and I will be tracking that as well as the speakers uh, throughout the event. To our speakers, um, as we said prior to uh, our attendees joining, feel free to turn off your videos when you aren't speaking, but when we have the Q&A and of course when you are speaking, please turn your video on. So before I hand over to the ambassadors, I think many might ask the question, you know, why are we having this webinar and what do we hope to achieve with this event? So the coronavirus pandemic is first and foremost a public health tragedy uh, that we're currently going through. However, the, the pandemic and the measures adopted to control the spread have played, placed incredible pressure on social health and fiscal systems. As governments look to manage deficits and stimulate the economies to recover from the crisis, now is the time to consider what economic model will best support this process. The Nordic example of fiscal policy is characterized by the pioneering introduction of energy and carbon taxation in the 1990s in response to a financial crisis. These measures, these measures excuse me, have coincided with a boom in clean energy related employment and a period of strong economic and environmental development. So one of the questions we want to look at is, could similar approaches work in South Africa? Or are there other strategies that are better suited to drive recovery here? So green taxes, which include taxes on road fuels, pollution and consumption, are already a key part of South Africa's fiscal system. So in this webinar, we'll explore their role in the fiscal system and potential for expansion as part of measures to stimulate economic recovery in South Africa. So we hope to answer or to begin to answer three key questions. The first of which is, what is the Nordic model of green fiscal policy? And what can we learn from Nordic experience that could be relevant to fiscal policy debates in South Africa? What role do green taxes play in South Africa's fiscal system? And finally, how can the fiscal system help South Africa to recover from the coronavirus pandemic? So to open up, I'm going to introduce um, our two ambassadors who will provide opening remarks. So allow me to first introduce, um, and it is my honor to do so, Her Excellency Ambassador Anne Lamilla, Ambassador of Finland to South Africa. Ms. Anne Lamilla commenced her term of office as Ambassador on the 1st of November, 2020. Um, ambassador is also the non-resident ambassador of Finland to Botswana, Lesotho and Mauritius. Her previous amb ambassadorial postings were Council General of Finland to St. Petersburg, Ambassador at Large for Gender Equality in the MFA of Finland, Ambassador of Finland to Mexico, Central America, Cuba and Haiti. Prior to this, she worked as the DCM at the Embassy of Finland in Washington, DC. Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the MFA and Deputy Permanent Delegate at UNESCO. She was previously posted to Brasilia and Madrid and worked in the MFA's political and economic departments. She's married and has three adult children. So Ambassador Lamilla, I hand over to you. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Chido. Uh, and, uh, Thank you all colleagues in, uh, uh, who are present here and uh, uh, good uh, afternoon all participants as well. 
it's uh, really a great honor for me to say uh, the opening remarks on behalf of the Embassy of Finland in Pretoria. So as you said, um, while well, Finland was the first country in the world to introduce a carbon tax in 1990. And since then, uh, my country has been in the forefront uh, what comes to environmental and climate-based taxation. Until the late 1980s, we used to have a command and control regulation. Environmental targets and standards were set up by the government and non-compliance of them implied sanctions to the industry and population. We then realized that carrots work better than stick. Economic instruments such as taxes and subsidies were created in order to regulate environmental externalities. Incentives were offered to the industry and general population to reduce their environmental harmful activities. Pollute a lot, pay a lot more taxes and vice versa. About two thirds of the CO2 emissions, uh, at least in Finland, come from energy sector. This is why Finland modernized its energy, car and annual vehicle tax structures in a series of reforms uh, from 2008 to 2011. Energy tax structure is now environmentally based so that the basis of the taxation is objective and technology neutral. CO2 emissions of vehicles were also included in the basis of the car registration and circulation tax. Nowadays, the share of renewable energy in the energy mix in the Nordic countries is above the EU average level and all five Nordic countries have been increasing their share of renewable energy. In order to do so, they have introduced subsidies and relatively favorable tax schemes for renewable energy and reversely energy taxes on fossil fuels. The Finnish experience on carbon pricing effectiveness shows that environmental based structure of energy and transport taxation works well towards achieving environmental goals coherently and cost efficiently. Uh, the Finnish uh, government uh, climate objectives are linked to the agreement within the European Union to be carbon neutral by 2050. Finland has, however, set a more ambitious national target of carbon neutrality by 2035 and moving quickly to carbon negative after that. A dramatic change is required for the transition to a low carbon society and economic instruments play an important role as they incentivize innovation and promote transition to clean and circular economies. Government cannot do this work alone and close cooperation with sector organizations and companies is required. So what is there for South Africa? Uh, the experience of Finland and other Nordic countries about the use of economic instruments such as environmental taxes is something that South Africa could make use of. As other countries in the world, South Africa needs to make a just transition to a carbon neutral society. Finland is ready to increase positive carbon handprint through lessons learned from our experiences and exporting uh, climate solutions. Finance ministers, to our mind, play a key role and they should be involved in the work. They know best the economic consequences of climate change, change the risks as well as opportunities. According to the report of the Global Commission of the Economy and the Climate, mainstreaming climate into financial and economic policy can unlock 26 trillion US dollars in investments and create 65 million more jobs through 2030. So climate uh, ministers for finance can also play a leading role 
in by incentivizing climate informed public expenditure and utilizing climate fiscal tools such as carbon taxes and emissions trading systems to cut emissions and prioritize low carbon growth. Finland, together with an other small country, Chile, founded the coalition of finance ministers for climate action. We invite South Africa to join the coalition. Already Nigeria, Ghana, Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya, Equatorial Guinea, Madagascar, Maldives are members in the coalition. We are missing South Africa. The idea uh, in this coalition is to share experiences on best ways to use taxation as a tool to work for a better future, mitigating the damage caused by climate change or COVID-19 and activating the economic growth at the same time. To conclude, establishing a causal link between the use of economic instruments and sustainable growth is not a straightforward task, as many other factors influence both sustainable development and economic growth. What is evident, however, is that the Finnish industries see the government's ambitious climate policy targets and the related measures as a driver of innovation and competitiveness internationally, despite the costs involved in the renewal of the economy. The 13 sectoral roadmaps developed recently by the Finnish industries on how to reach Finland's climate targets show that they are achievable for industry and other sectors with existing or upcoming technologies. This does require a favorable investment environment, a friendly and predictable business environment, RDI investments, available skilled labor and smooth regulation. We are convinced that environmental taxes and other economic instruments can promote sustainable growth by providing incentives to reduce emissions over time. They motivate people, municipalities, companies and industries to find more efficient ways of curbing emissions and developing new environment friendly technologies. In the pandemic situation, it's good to keep in mind that solutions that aim at the direction of carbon neutral or carbon negative economies are the most profitable ones in the long run. In this respect, economic instruments such as environmental taxes are something to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, for those remarks. Uh, our second opening remarks will be coming from our second co-host. So it is my pleasure to introduce His Excellency Ambassador Tobias Elling Rehfeld, Ambassador of Denmark to South Africa. Uh, Mr. Rehfeld is also the Danish Ambassador to Angola, Botswana, Mozambique, Namibia, Lesotho, Eswatini and Zimbabwe. Prior to this, Ambassador Rehfeld was the Under Secretary of State for Legal Affairs, um, and he has also previously served as head of the Department of Public International Law in the MFA. Before taking up this position, Ambassador served as a principal private secretary to the Danish Prime Minister. Um, the Ambassador has previously held positions of deputy head of the Department for Human Rights and of special advisor on international law in the MFA, and was posted as advisor on human rights to the Danish permanent representation to the United Nations in New York. Ambassador holds an LLM from the University of Copenhagen, as well as an MA in International Relations from the University of Exeter in the UK. Ambassador Rehfeld is married and has three children. Uh, the Queen of Denmark, Marguerite II, has decorated Ambassador Rehfeld as Knight of the Order of Dannenberg. Thank you, Ambassador, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Tiro. I, I think um, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So
You're muted, Cheeto. Sorry, you should be able to turn on your video now, Ambassador. All right, here we are. Thanks a lot, Cheeto, and thank you very much, Anne. Uh, the Danish Embassy is really happy to co-host this webinar together with the International Institute for sustainable development and of course the embassy of finland and i'm especially happy that we're joined today by so many prominent experts that will hopefully you know provide their input into this this important discussion now this discussion is important because it focuses on two big and difficult challenges that south africa is facing right now in the post-pandemic recovery first of all how can south africa create jobs for the millions of people that are unemployed and many of them that have lost their jobs uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic? And secondly, how can South Africa ensure that its recovery and future economic growth is sustainable? And I suspect a key part of the answer is almost certainly green taxation. I say this with a little bit of hesitation. Uh, earlier today, I was called a glorified salesperson for trying to push a renewable ag agenda here in South Africa. And I, I fear the sale of, of taxation is all always a more difficult issue, but I will, I will try my best here. So just to inform you that in Denmark, we have for almost 30 years um, been using green taxation as a tool uh, to create jobs and to reduce our CO2 emissions. Some taxes have been less effective than ex expected. Others have been highly effective. I think overall, it's fair to say that, that green uh, taxation has been one of the keys in driving uh, the Danish green growth. And of course, we are very happy to share our experiences if this can help unlock South Africa's potential in also achieving green and sustainable uh, growth in the future. Now, in Denmark, we implemented our first carbon tax on households back in, in 1992, so two years after our Finnish friends. And in 1996, the carbon tax on business sector followed. The goal with the carbon tax in the business sector was to increase energy efficiency and to reduce the CO2 emissions by 4.6%. Now, this goal was achieved and carbon emissions were reduced significantly. But the carbon tax not only reduced our CO2 emissions, the revenue coming from the tax was used to open the first chapter of what has been a huge, hugely successful Danish uh, win story. So wind projects, at the time still a very nascent industry in Denmark, were giving a refund from carbon tax, which improved the incentive to invest in, in wind projects. And today, the Danish wind industry accounts for around 35,000 direct jobs, or 2% of our private employment. And on, on the top of that, a lot of indirect jobs are created in the transport sector and the building sector and so on. Today, wind turbines and components make up for 7% of the total Danish, Danish export. So another good example of green taxation uh, that works is the tax on pipe water that was introduced in Denmark in 1994. Now in Denmark at, at the time and now there's no real water so, uh, shortage. The incentive was, uh, was um, with the law was instead to reduce the amount of wastewater and it worked immediately. The water consumption has since been reduced very significantly. And since then, both the drinking water tax and also the wastewater tax have continuously contributed to reduce the water consumption in the households. And I will just give you a few you know, statistics to, to, to illustrate this. The average consumption in Denmark of water is today 110 liters per person per day, 110 liters. In comparison here in South Africa, we are looking at more than 300 liters per person per day. So that means here in South Africa with all the inequality and lack of access to water, you still per person have an average of almost three times the, the average consumptions that we are facing in, in Denmark. Now the examples of the carbon tax and the water tax in Denmark both illustrates how green taxes can create awareness among both citizens and industries on reducing consumptions of natural resources, how green taxes can spur new innovative green solutions, and how they can boost a completely new generation of new jobs. The experience in Denmark is that it pays to invest into green technology solutions. However, green taxes not only uh, make economic sense, they also have to win political support. 
And in order to do this, our experience in Denmark is that the taxes have to be linked to popular and easy to understand measures. The way the revenue from an environmental tax is spent also has great impact on the tax social and pol political acceptance. On Denmark, we focused on spending the revenue on research and development and reducing other taxes, particularly for low income groups. Now here, the Danish embassy here in South Africa is very, very committed to share our lessons learned with South Africa and our partners here to help foster a just transition. We are now starting the third phase of our energy partnership with South Africa, a partnership where we have also focused on supporting the Department for Mineral Resources and Energy on the carbon tax offset system. We are also in full swing in our water sector uh, program where where we, among other things, are working uh, with water pricing. And last year, just before the COVID-19 pandemic paralyzed the world, the Danish tax committee of the Danish parliament had a successful visit to South Africa with great interactions with key stakeholders on carbon tax and how taxing instruments can be applied to foster green transition. And therefore, today I'm also very much looking forward to the discussion and to our deep dive into how green taxation can provide a path to post-pandemic recovery also here in South Africa. We need to build back better and greener. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to the presentations as well and to see what, what discussion we can uh, foster after, after the presentation. So first um, speaker who I'm going to hand over. So our agenda shifted a bit, but that's okay. Um, in terms of order of speakers. So first we have uh, Richard Bridal. So Richard is um, a colleague at ISD and he's a senior policy advisor. As a senior policy advisor, Richard supports ISD's Geneva-based global subsidies initiative. His research interests include efficient design of renewable energy, support policies, biofuels, green industrial policy, and energy subsidies. Richard has a background in the renewable energy industry with experience in policy analysis, project management and procurement. He has played key roles in the successful realization of a number of large scale renewable energy projects and has participated in national and international fora on renewable energy policy. Richard, i um, hand over to you. Thank you, Chido, and, and thank you to both ambassadors. I'm, I'm thinking that I should uh, really have to get a flag to put behind me. It's, uh, it's definitely a good uh, motif to have in a presentation. So today I'm going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to be expanding on some of the ideas that we've just heard from the ambassadors. Um, uh, and I'm going to be talking about what environmental fiscal reform or green fiscal reform or green taxes actually means in practice. And I'm going to be summarizing some of the broader experience from um, Finland and Denmark, but also some of the other Nordic countries too. So the first thing I was going, I'm going to say is just to kind of talk a bit about what we mean here by environmental fiscal reform. Um, so what, what, we, what we mean is using the tax system or the fiscal system, so that's the combination of taxes and subsidies to align uh, the way tax collection and revenue collection with environmental and social imperatives. Um, so this means that in practice, what we see quite a lot is about revenue recycling. So um, often tax increases are offset by spending commitments elsewhere. Um, and key areas which often government spends uh, recycled revenues on is energy because it makes sense because they're transitioning the energy system. If you increase taxes in one part of the energy system, offsetting them in another helps to kind of keep the overall cost of energy uh, the same. Um, Transport is another a popular kind of policy choice that governments have made. Um, and taxing air pollution and waste um, are, are key kind of are key areas where revenues can be raised and they uh, reduce harmful environmental externalities. So this diagram kind of shows a summary of, of the principles of, energy, uh, of environmental fiscal reform. So at the heart of the diagram is a kind of the, the idea of taxing pollution. So um, what that allows um, governments to do is to cut taxes on labor and business 
and this is the reason for this is that at the heart of environmental fiscal reform is the idea that uh, we should tax activities we want less of, like pollution, and we should reduce taxes on activities we want more of, like jobs, productivity, and, and economic activity. Um, at the same time, the revenues raised allow spending to be increased in other areas. So typically in the Nordics, they've been used to fund green industries. So we've, we've talked a little bit about the Danish wind industry already, um, but also, other green industries, energy efficiency, uh, buildings, building services that improve, that reduce energy consumption, all these kinds of things. Um, and also they've been used for to feed into general government revenues, which in which allows governments to spend money on uh, economic stimulus or social spending, um, and also on reducing government, uh, reducing deficits as well. Um, Finally, the price signal sent by the increase in taxes on pollution, it, it creates a signal to investors that they should invest in less polluting infrastructure. And that ultimately leads to reductions in pollution, as you, as you might expect. So that, that's the kind of the whole set of principles. Um, in terms of timelines, so as it's already been mentioned, uh, the Nordics have really been pioneers in this, and that's why we're kind of talking about the Nordic example here today. Uh, in the 90s, uh, in, in the early 90s, they were very quick to introduce uh, carbon taxes. Um, and uh, yeah, later in Iceland, um, and, and also taxes, tax levels on, um, on road fuels, on transport emissions, on air pollutants and waste are also much higher, higher than kind of typical OECD averages. So what does this what has this done? What is, what's the, the impact of this? Well, one of the big impacts is on revenue. Um, so the Nordic countries all raise between uh, US 7 billion and 13 billion, except for Iceland, um, which is a, a very small country. Um, which, uh, so uh, since in 2018, they all, all raised between that much. So it's a very significant amount of their tax take. Um, and to put that, in an international comparison, that's at least double the environmental tax capacitor, capacitor sorry, per capita of the OECD. And the median environmental tax per capita for Nordic countries was 7.5 7 times the global median. So they are kind of, they are outliers to some extent and, and pioneers. Um, one other thing I just note on this graph of revenue um, collection is you can see that there's a kind of peak um around 2008 and then it kind of flatlines and in some cases declines and that's kind of baked in because one of the, the features of environmental taxation is that um you have two effects the first effect is that polluting activities have to pay but the second effect is that um that behavior changes so different infrastructure gets built and so what you tend to see is this kind of initial ramp up as everyone kind of has to pay the tax and loopholes get removed and then a gradual decline as the economy becomes structurally less polluting and just less pe people are paying the tax. And that's kind of, that's what you would expect. And, and also what, what you want to see because you don't want to have high taxes that everyone just accepts and keeps uh, operating as business, under business as normal. So what has the money been spent on? So one of the first kind of key elements is about recycling. So that's making some of these elements uh, revenue neutral. So, so the the first kind of thing that governments have done is just reduced other taxes, and particularly popular have been personal income taxes and payroll taxes, particularly for low income groups. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. Partly because we want to have more, uh, we want to have more employment, so we want to reduce taxes on that. That's a good thing. And um, also because, as um, the uh, as Ambassador Tobias mentioned. Um, it's really important to make sure that you're bringing the people along with you. And one of the ways of doing that is to, um, to reduce things that impact them directly. So, tax, so income taxes are a very clear example of that. Um, also, tax recycling to vulnerable or industrial sectors um, that are exposed and will, will particularly see an impact of tax rises. So that can help to kind of bridge the gap and soften the blow. So 
Um, the other thing it's been used for, Iceland used uh, their carbon tax revenues to fund this, their deficit. Um, I am based in Switzerland. Switzerland used their carbon tax uh, revenues to provide um, low cost healthcare or, or, or to reduce the effective, to subsidize healthcare for people effectively. So all of these things that are quite popular, very easy to understand and um, yeah, and, 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 and are not just kind of the government filling its coffers, it's, it's being spent on things that really matter to people. And the third, the third element that Denmark also mentioned was about funding the green, funding innovation and the green energy transition. Um, so what's been the impact of this? So there's two things to say here. Firstly, if you want to look at the impact of these measures, it's really difficult to unpick them from what was happening anyway in the country. So we've got two tools that we can use for this. The first one is we can just look at what happened to the economies in these countries. And, and from that, we can see that um, kind of uh, GDP growth performed quite well. Um, and generally, um, I've got a few examples of that, some anecdotes of that. So following Sweden's green tax shift, Medium disposable income in Swedish households grew four times after 1995, four times faster after 1995 during the previous 20 years. Following Iceland's recession in 2008 to 2009 and the introduction of a carbon tax, Iceland's GDP per capita rebounded with 77% growth in the 2009 to 2018 period. And Norway continued to see strong economic growth and low uh, 2.5 to 5 percent unemployment through the 2000s while raising the carbon tax so those anecdotes tell us that at, at the very least the shift towards green taxes didn't kind of wasn't catastrophic for the economy uh, and, and was probably very good it's difficult to unpick it exactly so in order to try and disentangle it we have to look at models and so there are a number of studies that some of which are mentioned here um, which shows that there's kind of not too much effort evidence one way or the other on GDP growth as a whole, um, but it certainly wasn't negative. Um, and in terms of employment, I think there's one really interesting statistic here, which is that a 1% increase in energy taxes were projected in Denmark were projected to, co to cause a 2% drop in employment, but the 1% decrease in employment taxes that was accompanied by it was projected to co cause a 4% increase in, in employment. And I think that's the kind of, one of the key findings really is that yes, in raising energy taxes is a bitter pill to swallow, but if you use the money that's raised well to, to reduce kind of friction to employment and other positive things, you can get a much bigger increase in employment um, via kind of reducing barriers to that than just providing cheap energy. Um, and of course, the Danish wind industry is, uh, is, is globally very competitive and they're a pioneer and a leader in that. So in, in terms of, uh, CO2 emissions. Um, Sorry, Richard, I'm we've... going to need you to uh, speed that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm, I've got uh, two more slides. How about that? So I'll just finish this, which is to say that the um, emissions have increased very dramatically. So there's no question that the kind of shift to green taxes has had a has had a, a, a big impact for Denmark, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Finland, and Sweden. Um, so it's declined from, so Denmark's declined from a, a level of, around the OECD average to 48% of the OECD average over the period. So it's a very striking kind of change of fortunes. Um, I'm, I'm just going to skip over air pollution and just briefly talk about what this means for South Africa. So we're going to come on to this. The other speakers are eminently more qualified than me to talk about South Africa. But we know we can observe that South Africa already has a carbon tax. Um, it already has some high fuel taxes. So what else could be done? So the carbon tax is in place, but it has a lot of exemptions. Um, and it, it, we notably have met pollution problems. Um, so perhaps more fossil, notably coal is kind of coal taxes is a, another area that could be introduced. And what would you do with that income tax price? income tax and cash transfers, targeted stimulus for clean energy, uh, pollution abatement is a clear need for more pollution abatement technologies, and also aiding a just transition for exposed industries and vulnerable populations. So I I'm going to stop there and pass back to Chido. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Richard, for that presentation. And sorry to have to cut you short. Um,
Our next speaker is uh, Gaylor Martin Clair. Gaylor is a senior economist at Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies, otherwise known as TIPS. Mm. He leads TIPS's work on sustainable growth. Gaylor is also a research associate at the University at the University of Johannesburg Center for Competition, Regulation, and Economic Development. Excuse me. <clears throat> he holds two master's degrees. Uh, one in international affairs from Sciences Po Grenoble, France, and a second in energy and environment economics from Grenoble Faculty of Economics in France. Gaylor has been working on green economy issues for more than 12 years and has carried out extensive research on the transition to an inclusive green economy from a developing country perspective with the focus on policy frameworks, industrial development, just transition and resource security. Prior to TIPS, Gaylor worked at the French Ministry of Economic and, sorry, Economy and Finance, excuse me, as well as the United Nations Environment Program. Gaylor, uh, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Chido. Um, thank you for, for the invitation and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure uh, to be with you today um, to, to share a few thoughts on, uh, I guess green taxation and, and South Africa's socioeconomic development pathway. Um, I think the first the first thing to, to remember uh, as a way of introduction, which was mentioned by I think quite a few uh, of our speakers already, um, is that you know, if you look at the functions of the state, uh, which can be summarized as is, uh, obviously somewhat crudely, you know, from you know signaling priorities to resourcing desirable projects to providing infrastructure and other services to education development to regulating markets uh, setting norms and standards and having an impact on ownership you find um, fiscal policy being really at the crux of obviously market regulation um, but also infrastructure largely through pricing uh, and how we uh, incentivize projects through tax and subsidies. But it is part of, of course, a much bigger and much broader mix of measures that's being implemented. Um, and I think it's always important to remember that. Uh, and I think as it was you know, mentioned by some of our speakers, it's really hard to draw any kind of causal link between one specific policy intervention towards one specific impact. It's always part of a package uh, and there's always checks and balances, things to improve or minimize uh, the impact of a particular policy. Uh, that's true for taxation, that's true for uh, everything else. So it's just really important to understand that we're part of a package when we're talking about fiscal policy. If we look at a kind of green mix of measures, uh, we have a similar picture you find tax and subsidies as part of our economic measures. Uh, and in South Africa, we do have uh, some examples. It's not meant to be uh, comprehensive or exhaustive, the list here. But again, part of you know, uh, a mix of measures, which includes regulatory uh, measures, which includes direct government actions, particularly procurement, uh, which includes support measures, uh, like to companies, to R&D, uh, and as well, uh, information program that we have, for example, through our National Cleaner uh, Pollution Center. So once again, just important to keep in mind that uh, uh, there's a broad set of, of measures and we should be careful to say that you know, this measure led to that outcome solely. And I think that's really important. But let's turn uh, attention to the kind of environmental taxes that we, that we have in, uh, in South Africa already. Um, and I think we, we find quite a mixed bag of actual environmental uh, taxation in the country. We've had fairly successful impact on uh, FMCGs, you know, just sort of fast moving consumer goods. Uh, in the case of plastic bags, we've had a plastic bag levy for, for quite some time. Um, and you know, that's the rate uh, which are the, the blue uh, uh, diamond has been rising over time. Uh, and it's now about a 25 uh, cent per plastic bag. Um, and it has led to uh, some extent as part of 
a bigger mix of measures around communication and you know uh, shops phasing out, uh, it has led to a decrease in uh, the sales of, of plastic bag uh, in, in the country. Uh, interestingly, it was announced uh, in the budget yesterday, a differentiated uh, taxation for plastic bags and uh, plastic bag made of bio uh, uh, materials. Uh, we will have a, a lower uh, tax going forward. So some start of differentiation between the taxes for traditional product and a uh, greener product uh, is coming our way. If we look at uh, incandescent light bulbs, it's, uh, it's even uh, more marked uh, where we've seen a significant decline uh, in the sale of uh, incandescent light bulbs, of course, uh, as part of a policy package as well to phase out that kind of light bulbs in the country. So you know, where I guess the price is, is of a good is relatively small. Um, there are alternatives. Uh, and there's quite aggressive communication campaigns around it, it has had some relatively meaningful impact. We, when we look at other areas, the impact is more tenuous. If you look at the tire levy, it's been set at 230 uh, per kilogram net uh, and hasn't really had much of a, an impact. Uh, the, the decrease in taxation is largely due to uh, failing of the system. Uh, or if you look at our levy on electricity from non-renewable uh, energy sources, of course, it's largely inelastic at this point. Um, so it hasn't really had of an impact. We also have some other kind of green taxes. We have one on motor cars uh, based on CO2, but it's about for an average South African car, about 6,400 Rand, uh, fairly insignificant on the price of a new vehicle. So it hasn't really had much of an impact. Um, We've got some uh, interesting uh, taxes on uh, international air departure, as well as on merchant shipping for tanker. Uh, there's not enough data to understand whether or not this would have an impact, but they're really small compared to the actual cost of any uh, transaction in those sectors. Um, and we have a variety of other tax, uh, which you, know, you could argue are somewhat environmental taxes, like fuel taxes, sewage, solid waste, land fee get, but effectively are more here to pay for a service um, and are not really uh, direct environmental taxes uh, in many respect. So quite a mixed bag when it comes to, to different products. Um, <clears throat> what, about, what about other pricing? It's interesting that it was uh, mentioned was water and that you know, a green and just fiscal reform can help address socioeconomic inequality. It can help discourage unsustainable practices and encourage sustainable practices. If we look at water, and that's just one example, when it comes to water expenditure in South Africa per decile. So the upper is the richer decile in the country, lower is the poorer decile in the country. Not surprisingly, if you look at the block, the richer you are, the more you spend on water. But if you look at the share of your expenditure, it grows per decile. You know, the richer you get, the more you spend over your revenue of your income on water except for the highest decile. Clear, a clear problem in the system here you know, and where pricing and taxation should help address. You know, you could argue that this dot should be much higher or maybe off my chart. Um, so really interesting um, to see what the role of uh, green taxation, green and just action could play in that, in that respect. Turning our attention to uh, the other side of green taxation, which are subsidies and the big elephant in the room, fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, in, in South Africa, fossil fuel subsidies are estimated to be about 2% of GDP, uh, largely in terms of uh, pre-tax subsidies, which is linked to pricing, as well as foregone uh, consumption tax. Uh, and if you include externalities, primarily uh, climate change and air pollution, you get to a whooping 14% of GDP. Uh, that is uh, really astonishing amounts, primarily going to coal, but also petroleum. Uh, electricity and natural gas. Importantly, it dwarfs any kind of subsidy that we have in the country towards a green economy. Um, that's, uh, and that's the quantum is, is, is kind of huge. So I think we need, when we talk about taxation, we also need to look at the other side of the coin, which are the subsidies that are uh, operating in, in the country. <clears throat> the next uh, type of carbon pricing, of course, is the carbon tax. Uh, 
carbon tax. Uh, uh, we have one in South Africa since 2019. Uh, but uh, as you can see on this graph, which is rather buzzy, uh, it's uh, all the carbon taxes or carbon prices in the world that have been implemented. Uh, we sit here in South Africa. What does it mean? It means that here is the carbon price. So we are very low. We have a very low carbon price and that's the price without any kind of exemptions. Um, but interestingly, if you look at the scope of emissions that is covered, it's relatively high, about 80%. Of course, you find uh, the Nordic countries, Sweden here, uh, Finland here, you know, Norway, Denmark is right here uh, on the highest spectrum. Um, but what's interesting is that you know, in the South African case, obviously it's too early to tell whether or not it has any impact, um, but international studies on carbon pricing show that at a low price, the impact is really hard to actually decipher. Uh, it's not negative impact, but the positive impact is uh, really, really small. Uh, at higher prices, um, you do get more of an impact, uh, but I guess the question is, uh, is it just, you know, is it progressive? Um, of course, it's critical in the South African context with the level of inequality and poverty that we have, that any progress when it comes to carbon pricing is progressive. Um, to date, the uh, impact on uh, electricity has been neutral because it's replacing our previous levy on non-renewable taxes, but the impact on fuel is arguably regressive um, because that impact mostly uh, low-income households. Uh, the impact on quantitativeness is too early to tell, um, but what we need to see is a more important integration with the carbon budget process that has been unfolding uh, as well and being implemented by the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries. Um, always this debate is the carbon tax, the primary instrument, which then you know, gets enforced by carbon budget or uh, the other way around, a carbon budget being the primary instrument and the carbon tax being the enforcement mechanism. So we need to have some serious discussion around that because it has really some implications on the effectiveness of such uh, measures going forward. But it's important to compare carbon pricing with border carbon pricing. Um, border carbon tax uh, taxes are coming. Uh, what is a border carbon tax? Uh, countries say, well, if the, the goods coming into my country are not being taxed on carbon basis in their country of origin, I will tax them at the border. The European Union has made it very clear that they're going to implement uh, a border carbon tax from uh, January, 2023. Um, that could have dramatic implications for South Africa. If you look at this graph, which uh, uh, here is South Africa, that's the carbon intensity of exports. We are a extreme outlier uh, when it comes to our export in terms of carbon intensity. That's largely due to our uh, coal-based electricity, um, as well as a couple of other, uh, other factors. Um, so, it's important to understand that obviously a fair share of our exports go to the EU and they could be at a huge disadvantage come January 2023 if we haven't decarbonized or if we haven't taxed our uh, product adequately uh, domestically. The details of the BCA in Europe uh, are until uh, early to tell, but what is sure is that it's from a South African perspective, better to price carbon domestically and then be able to recycle those revenues to, in the country than to being taxed by our trading partners uh, and fund their development. Um, and we need to bear that in mind uh, as we uh, move uh, forward. Where does this leave us when it comes to a green and just recovery? Um, well, if I try and summarize the key kind of principles for a green and just recovery, um, I think there are four main principles. First one is that it should be local. You know, we need to ensure there are solutions that are coming from uh, South Africa and from Africa that work for us. The second thing is we need to make sure it's climate resilient. Um, we are already suffering the impact of climate change. We've seen it uh, in the water uh, sector, but in, in many others already. Uh, it should be just and inclusive. And that's critical uh, that it is biased towards uh, vulnerable groups. And that has important consideration when talking about taxation to make sure that it is actually progressive taxation, um, not even neutral, 
or aggressive, it should be progressive taxation. Uh, and often that is not the case. Um, and it should be low carbon and resource efficient to make sure that we avoid any kind of stranded asset. So where uh, do we uh, go from here? Um, I think that there are five key points when we're coming about the recovery. Um, the first one is building the infrastructure that we need for that. Uh, and here, of course, pricing, taxation plays a big role uh, when it comes to the energy, the transport, the water and sanitation, um, the waste management, but also our ecological infrastructure. The role that green taxation plays in here to make sure that we shift uh, the burden to uh, you know, high-income households, to uh, profitable businesses versus, versus vulnerable uh, stakeholders is, is critical. The second aspect is how do we unlock private investment as well as investment from households? That's clear in energy, but also in water and sanitation uh, and waste management. Again, pricing here is critical. How do we incentivize this? How do we compensate that? Then we need to support local activities. Uh, that's investing in local jobs. Um, and that's been very clear through the, the presidential uh, employment stimulus package, probably uh, around natural resource management. Then it's access to sustainable services. Um, you know, how do we make sure that everyone has access to sustainable housing, clean energy, clean transport, uh, and, and so on. And again, that's around pricing and taxation plays a big role. And last but not least, of course, fiscal reform is at the crux of this all, removing fossil fuel subsidies, I've mentioned that, but also investing and incentivizing new green solutions uh, is, is, is critical. So is a reform of administered prices, that's energy, that's water, that's also transport in some cases, uh, to make sure that we have a progressive uh, rollout going forward. So that's all I wanted to share uh, for today, some food for thought, hopefully, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gaylor, for that very thought-provoking uh, presentation. I noted down quite a few points that I'd like for us to, to pick up again when we have our Q&A, so thank you for that. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Trudy Makaya. Trudy Makaya is a writer, economist, and entrepreneur. In April 2018, she was appointed as a full-time economic advisor to His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa. In this role, she provides analytical support to the president on economic policy. This includes regular input on key issues and initiatives, interfacing with advisory structures and engaging with economic policy stakeholders. Trudy also serves as South Africa's G20 Sherpa. Before taking up this role, Trudy led Makaya Advisory, a boutique consulting firm with a focus on helping business navigate economic policy, including competition policy. Trudy has held non-executive directorships at Vumelana Advisory Fund and MT in South Africa. As an active public commentator, Trudy's columns have appeared in Business Day, Daily Maverick, and Acumen. She has also published academic journals, excuse me, academic journal articles on competition economics and policy. Trudy holds an MBA and an MSc in Development Economics from Oxford University, where she studied as a Rhodes Scholar. From the University of Wiesbaden, she holds an MCom in economics and an honors degree in economics and a BCom in law and economics. Trudy um, was a member of the executive committee at the competition, excuse me, at the Competition Commission of South Africa. Um, prior to joining the Competition Commission, Trudy held various management consulting and corporate roles at Deloitte South Africa, Genesis Analytics, and Anglo Gold Ashanti. Trudy, thank you so much for joining us and I hand over to you. Thank you so much, Chido. Um, and thank you for um, the invitation um, to share a few remarks um, this afternoon in this very informative um, webinar. Um, I mean, I, I've listened with interest um, to the presentations that came before. Um, and I think they've set out quite an interesting um, agenda for green fiscal reform um, in South Africa. Um, as many of you um, would be aware, and Gaylor touched um, on this in his presentation, last October, the president um, announced an economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Um, and the main aim of the recovery plan really was to, um, you know, provide an economic response to 
um, the damage that had been wrought uh, by the pandemic. Uh, but not only to do that, but to um, look to the future um, and ensure that we build um, an economy that is um, more jobs rich um, going forward. And that is also structurally transformed um, so that we deal with you know, challenges of inequality. Um, we also um, deal with um, the fact that our productive base um, has been declining. And so we need to um, reverse some of the deindustrialization that, that we've been seeing. Um, we also uh, want to be better integrated um, into our own continent. And so um, the, the recovery plan talks to um, those uh, principles. There were really four key elements um, um, of the plan. Uh, public employment um, with their recognition that in the short term, the private sector is not going to be the main source um, of new jobs uh, or that it might struggle to do so and government needs um, to provide livelihood opportunities um, to people in, in the interim. And as has been noted by Galo, um, some of those jobs have been um, in the green uh, economy in terms of ecosystem services, resource management, etc. But this is um, a short term stimulus measure. Um, looking forward, um, the second pillar of the recovery plan was around rebuilding the productive base of the economy and African um, integration. Now, um, a lot of, um, of our economy in terms of uh, our productive base, as I mentioned, has come under pressure, particularly given our energy constraints, uh, but we've also lost competitiveness. Our export basket to the rest of the world um, has been stagnant, whereas other emerging markets um, have grown their export market share. So that second pillar is very important in terms of um, building our productive uh, capabilities again, uh, and also uh, ensuring that we take full advantage of the African continental free trade um, agreement. Now, the, 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 within that, um, there is an ambition, of course, um, for green industrialization. You know, last week in his response um, to the State of the Nation debate, uh, President Ramaphosa spoke, for instance, about all our efforts to build the hydrogen economy. You know, over the past decade, there's been lots of investment um, in R&D, in training, in capacity building. And now our hydrogen economy is really ripe for commercialization and taking it to um, the next step. So we've had lots of developments around locally produced um, fuel cells um, throughout the pandemic. Some of the field hospitals used um, stationary solutions um, to, uh, to power um, those field hospitals as backup power. And so we're seeing something coming together there that brings together all our endowments from resources all the way from renewable energy, if the hydrogen is produced that way, um, to our platinum resources, um, to our materials, and, and to um, our services, our industries. Um, so it's important that we, we, we harness those opportunities um, for the future and that they're actively supported uh, by fiscal policy. The third uh, pillar is also um, on infrastructure development. And through the work of Infrastructure South Africa and the infrastructure offers um, in the presidency, uh, we've seen a pipeline of key projects uh, being presented um, for investors. Uh, so it, it's, it's around harnessing private sector investment uh, with the basis being public sector infrastructure and public sector financing. And in that, um, infrastructure South Africa has been very um, careful and, del and deliberate to seek sustainable infrastructure um, development, um, to you know, revitalize some of the programs um, that had been running um, uh, with limited success in terms um, of uh, greening buildings, uh, in terms of in energy efficient um, infrastructure, um, climate resilient and, and shock resilient infrastructure. So all of that is an important part um, of the infrastructure drive. And so when we talk about an infrastructure led economic recovery, there is an important um, green, agenda, uh, green element to that. And finally, the fourth pillar of the recovery plan was around um, energy security and the just transition. Um, a big part of the integrated resource plan that guides our energy procurement over, you know, um, for the country, um, a significant proportion will come from renewable energy. 
um, the procurement rounds um, have started uh, for, for uh, further bid windows for renewable energy or will be, um, the RFPs will be issued um, soon. Um, there's a lot of work to think about how we change, uh, increase the threshold uh, for own generation. And so, uh, you know, in terms of the just transition, I mean, the, 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 the green element is clearly uh, embedded into that. We've also um, had the inaugural meeting of the Presidential um, Climate Change um, Coordinating Commission, which brings together various stakeholders, including civil society, to think about the just transition. And one of the challenges that the president has put forward is how do we fund um, this just transition to ensure that uh, we're able to harness the resources to make it possible without um, creating distortions on a net basis, without being left with net job losses uh, or with certain communities bearing a disproportionate brunt um, of that just transition. Of course, many of the institutions that are represented on the commission and some of those stakeholders have thought deeply um, about how one goes about a just transition and the National Planning Commission um, has also convened very important work in terms of trying to come to uh, a common understanding uh, of, of those pathways. And so having said that, having talked about, you know, those pillars of um, economic recovery, public employment, uh, the productive base of the economy, infrastructure development, energy security, and the just transition. Um, and all of that underpinned by the economic reforms pursued by Operation Willingzela, which is about increasing um, the productivity of the, of the economy, reducing the costs of network industries, and ensuring that we have um, an efficient economy um, that works, that doesn't frustrate business people, that doesn't frustrate small business, um, doesn't frustrate um, international investors. But the question then becomes, um, how do we effectively deploy carrots and sticks um, to encourage the industries of the future and, of course, correct the distortions um, and give the right signals to those activities that don't serve uh, people and the planet well. And I think from the presentations that have come forth, you do see that there has been um, nascent effort um, to try to work towards that portfolio um, of um, carrots and sticks um, that will ensure that uh, we achieve exactly that. We encourage um, a move towards a greener economy and discourage um, that which has negative externalities. You know, yesterday was um, our national budget. Um, so we have a very fragile economy that has been pummeled by the pandemic. Indeed, in the budget, there were no new revenue raising um, tax measures um, in recognition that we don't want to stifle um, a recovery by increasing um, taxes, at least not at this stage. So it becomes important to identify a pro-recovery green taxation agenda that also speaks to those constraints, um, that there isn't much uh, that we would be able to do to push the envelope um, towards revenue raising measures um, at this stage. We also have very limited fisc fiscal space um, to spend on the carrots. Um, so I think this brain's trust that you have here needs to think about how do we rebalance the incentive portfolio that we do have uh, at the moment um, to reduce the distortionary ones and move towards subsidies that support the right things. Um, as you would know, for instance, we have a very robust automotive development program um, with um, you know, support um, to um, OEMs, global um, auto OEMs. And recently, um, some of them, notably Toyota, uh, will start pivoting towards using those um, resources um, that, that government support to move towards producing hybrids um, in South Africa. And so, you know, within existing um, incentive resources, we are able to pivot uh, more towards um, green activities. And of course, we need to do more of that. So there's got to be a concerted um, level of effort to think about within the current uh, incentive framework how do we um, reorient it uh, towards um, the green economy? Uh, but I've, I'm, I'm quite encouraged uh, by some of what has been said, particularly that um, 
its growth you know, in experience shows that green taxation has been growth neutral at worst and perhaps uh, a positive growth impact. But I mean, I, I would like to leave this audience just with the understanding that growth neutral is probably fine. Um, but the, the one real message um, that has been positive from the presentation was that the employment uh, impact was positive because that is absolutely where we're going to focus on whatever we do. Um, the employment um, and impact is the absolute priority. And so in, in showing the evidence, uh, in building the case uh, for green fiscal re reform, we need to zoom in on how we build an overall strategy that is supportive of job creation on a significant scale. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Trudy. We appreciate your time and your thoughts, um, particularly because of, of your role being so close to the presidency. Uh, we, we have some interesting questions we'd like to follow up with you in the Q&A, so thank you for that. Um, we are going to move to Tony. So our last presenter has had to drop out and, and she'll be back um, with us shortly, Dr. Machingabi. So now we'll move to Tony. Enrich, uh, Tony, I'm so sorry, I, pro I probably uh, butchered that. Tony is currently uh, with COSATU. Uh, previously, he was a leader of the opposition in the city of Cape Town Council, where he was a member of the Economic, Environmental and Spatial Planning Portfolio Committee. Um, he was also the former provincial secretary for the Western Cape for COSATU. Um, and in his capacity at COSATU, he's represented um, them at the World Trade Organization in Doha, International Confederation of Labor, Labor Trade Committee in Geneva, Organization of African Trade Union, Un Unity in Ghana, and Unions Bilateral with French Trade Unions in Paris. That's quite a mouthful. Tony um, will give us some brief comments and thoughts um, from the speakers before we um, go into the Q&A uh, and then lastly hear from Dr. Machingabi. So Tony, um, I hand over to you uh, for any questions, comments, thoughts that you may have from the presentations we've, we've heard. Thank you very much, Chidu, and thank you to everyone who did presentations. It really is an honor to be part of this. And can we just thank those who put together the session, because what it does is it helps us to much more carefully in South Africa locate what we want to do, but also have some empirical insights on what other countries have done and the lessons out of that, especially what the developments are in the Nordic countries and how we can learn from that. I think Gail Noor has done a fantastic job to outline what the various tax measures are and other measures that we have in place in South Africa to deal with questions of green taxes. The plastic bag levy, especially the unions played a big part in defining that it had an impact on industry in the short term, but in the longer term industry was able to reposition itself and the environmental advantages of that uh, levy had been obvious and it continues to expand and be an area that we take forward. The other areas that these outlined from the light bulbs to the tire levy, the taxes on cars, all of that goes to the kind of measures that South Africa is moving towards. And even though it's encouraging, the scale of it is not at the levels that we should be, we should be looking at it. I like the idea that's emerged in respect of the carrot and sticks because one experience that we've developed in South Africa is that the employers and capital in particular is not keen on some of the measures, but clearly it's something that we've all got to move towards. We have to embrace and the sooner we move towards that, judging by the experiences, we are able to take on board the positive elements of that. Some of the examples that have been outlined in the Finnish uh, explanation clearly shows us that the job prospects are immense if we're able to move to that timelessly. The Danish industry around wind turbines and the wind so and the wind energy that developed from that provides a lot of opportunities for us. And while there are some wind farms in South Africa, a lot of the high-end technological inputs are still important and that creates a real opportunity for us to be looking at in South Africa. In addition to the developments that I think people are aware of, what is unfolding in South Africa at the moment is the development of master plans around the renewable industry. And one of the discussions that have been absent in those master plans that have looked at supply side and demand side measures, what are the industries that we have in place, and what is the kind of support that we can provide for the setting up of industries in South Africa. We do need to look more coherently at how we're able to bring about 
the scale of the measures that provides both sustainable and renewable energy in South Africa, but starts to deal with some of the effects of the coal fired and other carbon carbon measures and carbon ca carbon driven energy sources. We clearly have a lot of uh, ESCOM coal fired power stations that are reaching the end of their viable lives. And we have got policy options in place, but it doesn't specifically and in more in enough detail look at what is the just, just transition for employers and communities and employees in areas where we're going to see changes away from coal-fired power stations and what are the support for renewable measures that's in place there. Uh, given the tight fiscal space we have at the moment, these taxes can go a long way towards assisting in providing and funding that just transition and putting in place alternative renewable sources of energy in those areas to make sure that we are able to change from old carbon driven energy sources to the new modern renewable energies. So certainly out of the measures that we have in place, a lot of encouraging signs, but the clear measure is that we've got to move with more speed. Trudy makes an important point about what the developments are in South Africa, the linkages between the National Development Plan, the specific industry measures that they have in place, and also how South African government is looking at both carrot and sticks as the way to address that. I should just say under the Climate Change Commission, we have a direct representative there, and that is Lebohang Mulausi, who I'm really standing in for today because this is an area that she is the resident expert on with Inkosatu and is leading a lot of the developments uh, that are taking place from the side of labor in what we'd see out of many of those issues. So clearly, very thoughtful, provoking presentations that have been done lots of food for thought in respect of the fiscal space that South Africa finds itself in and how we can use the moment to be able to move towards green taxes and how that can help us to fund the post-pandemic recovery in South Africa. Chair, those are some initial comments. I did circulate earlier a few notes from Lebohang to me that I thought the panelists and the participants would find interesting, so I hope that you share it with them. But thanks for inviting us to be part of this, and we're certainly keen to be part of an ongoing conversation that helps us to better position ourselves as South Africa, but also ensures that we can build on some of the experiences that have been outlined today by our colleagues from the other countries. Thank you very much, T.D. Tony, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, very interesting, very thought-provoking, and some that we will take forward in the Q&A. Um, also, thank you for sending through uh, the, the materials that you did to me by email, and I'll be sure to share them with the participants and uh, the speakers. We now are going to finally move to Dr. Memory Machingabi before we go to our Q&A. Um, just a quick... <clears throat> So because yesterday was a budget speech, Dr. Memory had quite a few speaking engagements. So we're so grateful that you're able to rejoin us. Um, Dr. Machingabi is a senior economist for environmental and fuel taxes for the National Treasury, where she has been for eight years. Prior to this, she was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pretoria and a senior lecturer at the University of the Western Cape. Dr. Machingabi holds a PhD in natural resource and environmental economics from Texas A&M University and a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Economics from the University of Zimbabwe. Thank you again for joining us um, and we will hand over to you uh, for a brief presentation before we then have a short Q&A. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thanks, Chido. Um, I will... Okay. I'll try to share Sorry. my screen. Let me just make your co-host one moment. Okay. okay, you should be able to share your screen and put on your video now. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, everyone is able to see? Yes, we can. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, I have, uh, it's a number of slides, uh, but I'm not going to uh, talk to uh, all of them. Uh, I guess I'll just uh, highlight uh, in terms of green taxes, what we are thinking and uh, what we've done. 
So this uh, mostly most of our green techs is uh, actually uh, what we call environmentally related taxes because of the tax base. So we look at the environmental problems that are in South Africa and uh, a number of them is where the taxes apply. So we've got a climate change issue like the rest of the world. We also have issues with local air pollution. Uh, we are a water scarce country and uh, there's inappropriate disposal of wastewater into our resources. And we also have a waste uh, problem. I think we are ranked 12th in terms of marine pollution. And uh, we have issues with uh, electronic waste, tires and such. And also a land degradation program uh, problem uh, and biodiversity loss. So just to emphasize that, uh, I guess as a treasury, we just don't look at the quantity of growth, but we also want to uh, look at the quality of growth because it matters. And the reason why we have uh, these green taxes uh, is because uh, we have, uh, in a, the environmental problems are highlighted. Uh, a lot of them have resulted in market failures where uh, the resources are not provided uh, efficiently. And uh, we are just trying to correct that externality. And within our environmental legislation, which underpins uh, all uh, the work that's done on the environment, we observe a polluter pays principle in South Africa. And this, uh, the taxes we are applying uh, to try and uh, apply that polluter pays principle and to correct market failures. So when we impose uh, the green taxes, they are in addition to the standards that the departments implement. And uh, they sort of complement because we can't just have uh, taxes by themselves. And what underpins our taxes is uh, the environmental fiscal reform policy, uh, which was uh, first published in 2006, uh, but was updated in 2010. So the environmental fiscal reform policy, like you have, I guess, in Europe, uh, provides that uh, coherent tax policy framework for us to be able to impose taxes for negative externalities and uh, tax incentives for positive externalities. And also for us to have that, uh, I guess, framework for us to be able to evaluate these taxes. And uh, most of the reason why we impose these taxes is to correct behavior, not to raise revenue. Although when we raise the revenue, it's sort of, uh, a double dividend, but that's not the reason why we impose these taxes. So the taxes also follow the generally accepted principles of taxation and uh, you know the efficiency, equity, certainty, simplicity, and cost minimization. And uh, the taxes also, when we do a tax, the carbon tax took us 10 years to implement because we consult and we want to minimize the competitive impacts on business. And we also look at the distributional impacts. We don't want to prejudice the low income households. We don't want to prejudice a certain, uh, anyone I guess in the economy. So, which is why uh, now there's also the talk of a just transition. So we look at the distributional impacts and what other policy areas are and how we are influencing that. And in terms of revenue use, we don't earmark uh, environmental tax revenue. Why? Because as a treasury, we just don't earmark uh, revenue, but also if the tax is working as it should be, what's supposed to happen is the level of the pollution is supposed to go down as, the, as we progress. So if you've earmarked that particular revenue for the particular program, it means you will run out of revenue as the pollution uh, becomes less and less. And then, uh, so in terms of the taxes that apply in South Africa, currently we have a carbon tax on greenhouse gas emissions. We've got an electricity generation levy uh, that applies to non-renewable based electricity and nuclear based uh, electricity generation. We've got fuel taxes on our petrol, our diesel and our biodiesel. Uh, we also uh, have an incandescent globe tax to incentivize people to buy the more energy efficient bulbs. We've got a motor vehicle carbon emissions tax that applies 
uh, to when you buy your vehicle, we want to incentivize you to buy vehicles that are emissions, uh, that are less emissions intensive. So if uh, the emissions that will be emitted by a vehicle are above a certain standard, we impose a tax on that so that we are uh, sort of influencing behavior at the purchase point. We also have a plastic bag levy that applies to plastic bags uh, and a tire levy that applies to waste tires. So we discourage uh, their disposal into landfills. Uh, this is showing the tax incentives that apply. Uh, I've talked to the taxes. So we've got tax incentives within the system. We've got an accelerated depreciation allowance for renewable energy. We've got an R&D uh, tax incentive. We've got uh, tax incentives for biodiversity conservation and uh, an energy efficiency tax uh, incentive. So in terms of uh, the revenues that come out of our environmental uh, uh, taxes, they form almost uh, uh, you know, just above 6% of the budget. And uh, if we take away the fuel levy, which is about 85% of the total environmental taxes, you find that we collect about 1% of our total tax uh, revenues are from those environmentally related taxes. And uh, in terms of the reforms going forward, we are working on an environmental fiscal reform review paper because the last one was in 2010, but we're looking forward at what can we enhance going forward. And that's, uh, that will be out for comment once we're done with it. Uh, we also want to look at the sector impacts of the carbon tax and uh, just uh, in terms of also the just transition considerations. Uh, modifying the electricity generation levy. We've uh, started work on fossil fuel subsidies reform uh, in terms of our fuel taxes. And I would want to uh, work more on motor vehicle emissions taxes and congestion charges and local air pollution uh, taxes uh, going forward. And uh, in terms of waste, we've started work, I think the Department of Environment has started work on landfill taxes and we've provided comments, but we're also looking at uh, producer responsibility in terms of the tire levy, uh, how we treat the bio-based plastic bags. And uh, in terms of the water, we want uh, to have a tax on waste discharge charge so that we disincentivize companies from polluting the water at source and within the resource, and also having our water bills or our water charges being cost reflective of the actual value of water and also reviewing the biodiversity tax incentive. So that's what we're looking at going forward. But uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, concluding, we can just, I uh, guess, highlight the fact that we have implemented an environmental fiscal reform policy uh, that we want to improve on because we realize even though we're a developing country, we want to take the negative externalities that come out of uh, the pollution uh, that we generate. And it is good to hear the examples of what the Nordic countries have done and also to exchange, I guess, notes on going forward, what we can improve uh, on as a country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Machingabi. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, so we have a few questions that we want to pose to some of our speakers. So I'll just note your names. So we have questions in the Q&A that are being answered at the moment. So I'll let uh, Ambassador Raphael Richard continue to answer those questions. But some other questions that I want to pose. Uh, so I'll just say all of them, then you can respond. And then we'll, then we'll wrap up because we're running out of time. So I think I'll, I'll wrap up this session at uh, 15.35, if that's possible, 15.40, so 10 minutes over. So firstly, to memory, um, you spoke about congestion charges, increasing the fuel tax. What types of fiscal reform policies can the country implement to support EVs um, and that industry? Particularly because also South Africa has got quite a big um, automotive manufacturing sector. So where, where do you think fiscal policies could fit in in that discussion? And then secondly, a question to you is, why do you think that the carbon tax in South Africa is priced so low? And 
has so many exemptions. So how do we increase the impact of that tax? Um, you can answer both, you can answer one. Um, and then Trudy, we have a question for you. So in your presentation, you didn't talk much about tax. Um, and we wanted to find out whether you see tax as a way to pay for some of the industrial policy and climate resilience uh, that you mentioned. Um, and then also, do you see the carbon intensity of South Africa's economy as a risk for exports? So Gaylor in his presentation did talk about that. He talked about carbon, excuse me, border carbon tax and how that will affect trade. So what are your thoughts on that? Again, you can answer, I mean, given time, you can probably answer one. So I'll leave that up to your discretion to decide. Um, and then question to Richard, um, since we're looking at sort of the, the Nordic example of fiscal reform. So if there's evidence that, that seems to be supportive of environmental fiscal reform, why isn't it being done everywhere? And where do you think from the work that you've done, there are key areas or gaps that South Africa could learn from? Um, so just a few questions. Um, please, any other speakers, uh, you're more than welcome to comment. Um, thank you. I'll maybe ask Dr. Manchingabi to start off and then to go to Trudy, and then I'll open the floor to any other speakers for final comments, and then we'll close the session. Okay, thanks, Chido. Uh, so in terms of uh, where the fiscal reform comes in uh, on the congestion charges and all, uh, what we're looking at is um, when we say we impose fuel taxes currently, it's a volume-based uh, tax. So we want to like break it down and say, you know, in terms of uh, when we impose the tax, uh, this is how much, because when we use vehicles, there's a lot of externalities that come out. There's congestion, there's accidents, there's noise, there's pollution. So we uh, would really love to be able to break it down in terms of those elements to be able to say, uh, you know, for congestion uh, charges, although you know the most effective way of doing that is by tolling, not really by taxation. But in terms of uh, the other externalities, local air pollutants, for example, uh, how do we take care of that? Because you find that there is a tax differential. Uh, petrol is taxed more than diesel, but diesel has a worse environmental impact. So those are the issues we will be looking at. And a congestion charge, uh, it could actually come in terms of uh, the motor vehicle your, when you renew your license. Uh, remember, they just look at the weight of the vehicle right now. We could actually be looking at the emissions uh, impact of those vehicles, especially the old vehicles, uh, in terms of the annual uh, charges that happen. That's what uh, we're looking at, but then we need to work with local government on that. And in terms of the carbon tax, the reason why uh, we have a lot of tax-free allowances and the rate is very low is because we are phasing it in. We don't want to shock the economy. We want to provide that uh, breather to it give space for transition to our industry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manchengabi. Trudy, um, any comments or responses to uh, any questions that are in the chat or that are posed? Yeah. Um, no, thank you for that. I mean, I think that, the, you know, the carbon intensity um, is an obvious um, risk uh, for our, our exports. I don't think there's any question around that. Um, in terms of tax reform, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, I think our fiscal framework is such that in a fragile economic recovery, um, anything you do on the revenue side um, is going to be very difficult, uh, very diff delicate uh, to increase any taxes, um, to extract revenue from the economy um, at this time. So you do have to think about it in a portfolio sense uh, and also think about then what you do um, on the subsidy side. And I think when I look at the fiscal framework there, the, the challenge is just obvious um, that uh, we can't increase um, the, the expenditure ceiling um, that much uh, further. And so it does become important to think about how we rebalance um, the incentive portfolio that we already have. Hence the, the example I gave on autos, that you're seeing um, those incentives increasingly uh, being driven towards um, hybrids, hopefully EVs at, at some stage. Uh, so I think those are the kinds of maneuvers 
um, that would be realistic uh, in, in our case. And then finally, on our competitive advantage, I mean, I think one thing we could think about is that, you know, we've always talked about beneficiation, which is the tough sell um, with our energy constraints. But if you think about um, a lot of other materials that are needed for the future, like platinum, vanadium, nickel, you know, there's been a global call for nickel, nickel deposits, copper even. Um, if we think about how we manage our, our resources and try to encourage as much um, local production based on that resource base, I think it's, it's a good step uh, in terms of at least using some endowments that we already have um, to encourage um, development of those green industries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trudy. Um, I'd li like to, Richard, I see you're unmuted. If you want to answer your question, go ahead. Otherwise, I'd like to open up to the rest of the speakers and to the ambassadors for any final thoughts or comments before I close the session. Okay, I'll, I'll combine uh, my answer with final thoughts as well. So just the question that you posed to me was about why I think if it's such a good idea for environmental fiscal reform, is it not happening everywhere? And I think that there's, um, primarily it's a question of, um, it's a difficult sell. I think that raising taxes, uh, we've seen it in a lot of movements. So the, the yellow vests movement in France, where uh, a, a series of environmental taxes led to kind of like widespread public opposition. I think that um, politicians still feel like raising taxes, even if they are green, um, is still a very difficult sell to their electorates. And I think that linking it to kind of popular measures and measures that are, are readily understood and maybe not explicitly earmarking, we heard that there's some problems with that um, for many treasury departments, um, but, but trying to package it in a way that people feel like, okay, energy prices have risen, but there's a kind of wider benefit to society and we, and we kind of, we, we buy that story. And I think that's the real challenge for reformers of green taxes. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, I'm going to close the session. Do we have any final comments, questions from the panelists before I do so? Right, I'll take, oh, Ambassador Tobias, please go ahead. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Chido. I, I, I just wanted to, it's, it's just a reflection that, that combines the taxation discussion and discussion on investments and job creation. I think it's, it's, it's clear that there's been a sort of a false narrative that, that going green and be part of the green transition will, will mean, mean that you lose on the job side. And I, I think it's clear to everyone now that that, that is a false narrative. There's, there's a huge potential for job creation in, in the green sectors, in the renewable energy sectors. And I think there's this element of, of being first movers really has to be taken into account. I think South Africa has a huge potential for being a first mover country, uh, certainly on the African continent. If the policies are right, if the tax incentives are right, um, th then, then South Africa has all the potential to, to be the next green revolution in this, this part of the world, because you have you know, well-documented huge resources in solar and wind. So it's a question of creating the right incentives to investments into those areas. And I think we, we have to, you know, incentive part is important because of course businesses will be a little cautious that they have to pay extra in taxes, but then if they do the right investments, you know, those, um, those extra taxes will dwarf in comparison to what they save Let's, let's, say they, let's say they save two thirds of the water supply. Let's say that, you know, like here at the Danish embassy in Pretoria, we install solar panels that cover most of our electricity, electricity needs uh, at the embassy. Those solar panels will be paid back in a six to seven year period of time. So, you know, after six years, this will just be a surplus for us at the embassy. So if taxation can work as, as one of many tools in the toolbox, to create the incentives, then the initial investments will be small compared to the benefits you can have in the long run, both as individual businesses, but certainly also as South Africa has a, a great economy on the African continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, we have Ambassador Lamilla, and then I'll go to um, Gaylor, and then I'll close the session. Ambassador, please go ahead. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Chido. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, comment what uh, what my my colleague Tobias said. Uh, it is our, the experience of Finnish companies that it's really uh, um, it pays off to to be in the forefront with uh, uh, what comes to uh, um, uh, ecologically uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, solutions. Uh, what is uh, really important, though, is that the government uh, says explicitly what is the target, by when should the companies uh, comply with new, new uh, climate uh, change targets. And that really gives them a, a possibility to, to develop, develop their, their technologies uh, in order to comply with the new legislation. And uh, it is our experience that uh, jobs are created uh, because uh, in, in today's world, uh, the buyers, they, uh, they really don't want to have a production which has been produced uh, not environmentally friendly. So uh, the, the demand for products um, from those countries that don't use uh, env environmentally uh, uh, sustainable uh, methods, it will sink. Uh, who would buy uh, coal today, for example? Uh, just uh, it's so um, it's really uh, it's good to be in the forefront. And uh, I just read we we had yesterday the Finnish uh, climate panel uh, gave, gave uh, recommendations for our government, and uh, it was mentioned that. Um, things changed very quickly. For example, uh, right now, it's maybe uh, uh, more uh, cheaper to buy a, uh, a normal uh, car that uses uh, combustible. But uh, it's um, uh, even now, when you buy a new car, uh, you can uh, calculate that it's, uh, it pays off to, to buy a, uh, an electric car because the value of the electric car will stay much better than, uh, than uh, an ordinary ordinary car. So uh, things really change quickly. And I think South Africa, as, as Tobias said, also is, uh, has all the possibilities to become a, a, a country that uh, leads the other, other countries in the region to a more sustainable growth and with more, more jobs as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Gelo, uh, I'll let you speak finally before I close the session. Thanks, Chido. Uh, I'll be very brief. I just want to share two thoughts, uh, which I can leave the audience with. There was a question about South Africa being competitive in a green economy. There are tremendous amount of opportunities, way too many to discuss right now, happy to engage separately. We, for example, launching next week a report on the development of the lithium and battery value chain in South Africa. Tremendous opportunity for the country. You know, there are so many that we can look into, happy to engage separately. And a last thought, really, which I think we need not to forget that green tax friction, particularly in South Africa, will work only if it is progressive. You know, we have high levels of poverty, the highest level of inequality. We, it will not be accepted if we end up subsidizing high-income households to buy electric cars and solar panels when we leave behind the bulk of the population. It will only work if we have progressive green taxation. And that's really important to keep in mind as we enter that journey uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gelo. And that's quite a, a perfect note to really end on. And I just want to wrap up really and say I've heard a lot about sort of the role of government in revising environmental fiscal reform. And that's why we're so pleased to have you know, sort of two branches, the presidency with, of course, Trudy, and then Treasury with Dr. Machingabi. And I think also what we've heard a lot about is learning from other countries. And, and this is why we had the co-hosts, um, both uh, the, the embassy of, of Finland and the Embassy of, of Denmark uh, join, joining us as co-hosts. Um, and then I think also what's been echoed um, count, countless times by different speakers is also the opportunities for, for South Africa to be a leader in this region. Um, there are many opportunities. Uh, there have been some studies that have been shared by Gerolf and TIPS. Um, and it's just quite exciting um, for us as a, an organization as well to see the gaps and, and and where we can contribute to meaningful research and to meaningful work on the continent. So I want to thank you all. Uh, thank you to um, 
Ambassador Miller, Ambassador Rafael, to our speakers and to all our attendees for attending. Thank you to the organizing team, which includes um, person, persons from the different embassies, which includes uh, Max Schmidt, who is with ISD, Richard, um, and our comms team who are currently sleeping, I think, in Canada still. Uh, very grateful for your input. Finally, um, two things. Richard just shared a link in the chat box. So ISD South Africa now has a mailing list. So you can keep up to date um, on our in-country work and events. So please subscribe to that. And then we also have another webinar that's coming up on the 9th of March at two o'clock South African time. And that will be on community and publicly owned renewable energy projects in South Africa. And that will also coincide with the launch of our report, which is on um, increasing the deployment of community owned renewable energy in the country. Thank you all for your time. Um, take care. Um, and we hope to engage with you all um, at a further point. Thank you. Thank you.